Y acá, en este momento, voy a presentar a mi gran amigo eh, y uno de los, de los creadores del ecosistema digital en Latinoamérica, Ariel Arrieta. Bienvenido. Gracias, Pablo. Eh, no voy a hablar yo, digo, eh, lo que vamos a hacer es invitar a Ted One. Eh, Ted One es un amigo, eh, es principalmente abogado, pero a pesar de ser abogado es muy buena persona. Eh, Ted es un abogado de Silicon Valley y lo invitamos principalmente porque queremos... Eh, transmitir alguna de las ideas y de la cultura que, que pasa en Silicon Valley y ver qué, qué de eso podemos aprender, como decíamos ayer, no buscamos replicar Silicon Valley, sino crear nuestro propio Bollywood. Y para eso tenemos que eh, adaptar el ecosistema local a, a, a lo que es eh, las buenas prácticas de Silicon Valley. Eh, Ted fue abogado, es abogado, es uno de los socios de, de Fenguin and West, que es un, un estudio muy importante, pero él personalmente fue, fue el abogado de eh, varios startups como, como Facebook en su comienzo, eh, como Twitter, eh, es más, fue el único abogado que fue de Facebook y de Twitter. Y si leen el, el libro Twitter Hatchack, él aparece entre, en, 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 esas, en ese relato de, de las grandes discusiones de todo lo que pasó dentro de, de, de Twitter. Pero no fue solo abogado de ellos, sino también fue de empresas como Pads, Square, Stumble Open, eh, Sonos, Dropbox, todos unicornios, todos billion dollar companies. Y tiene unas historias increíbles de eh, la cocina de, de, de Silicon Valley. Y por suerte tenemos la, la suerte de que esté viviendo acá desde hace tres meses y con un plan de quedarse durante todo, todo un año. Entonces, eh, cualquiera que eh, pueda tener acceso a él y pueda eh, eh, aprovechar esa experiencia acá, creo que es algo invaluable que tenemos. Eh, con ustedes, Ted. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias uh, por invitarme uh, a esta reunión. Uh, tal vez uh, ustedes uh, han visto el video de Mark Zuckerberg hablando en chino. Sí, eh, sí, eh, sí. Es increíble, sí. Y él uh, participó uh, de una conferencia en Beijing y sorprendió uh, a todos uh, hablando solamente en mandarín. Y desafortunadamente no soy Mark Zuckerberg. Y entonces uh, voy a hablar en inglés. Uh, so, uh, the name of this talk is My Startup MBA, and uh, it is uh, about the things that I've learned as a, as a startup company lawyer. And the idea is that I can share some of these ideas with you about the things that, uh, that, that I've learned and, and, and been inspired by. So, the beginning of the talk is, uh, that's me, who I am, Lionel Hutz, a, the famous lawyer. And the question is, well, what does a lawyer have to teach me here today? You know, uh, I, I really, I can hire a lawyer when I need one, and, uh, and, and he can take care of forming my company and, and the like. And, and so let me explain a little bit about what I do, because I think it's important to understand this talk. Uh, the first thing I do is I have to understand the law, of course, so my companies can comply with the relevant laws. The second thing I do is work on transactions. So when companies are raising money or selling themselves to other companies or doing public offerings, I need to understand how all those things work and, and to navigate those things uh, for my clients. Uh, if I look a little bit tired, it was because I was doing that late into the night last night. Uh, but the third thing that I do, which I think is the most interesting part of my job, is to help my companies by giving them the benefit of all the experience that I have. And the, the reason I have these experiences is that I've seen these movies many, many times before. I've had the good for fortune to work with many, many, many companies. And in a way, startup companies are like children. Everyone thinks their children is very special and the only child in the world. But there tend to be a lot of similarities between these children. And uh, so there is a, a, lot, a lot to learn. And I think about this part of my job as, uh, as like being a fishing guide. I don't know if there are any fishermen in the audience, but when you go fishing and you hire a good guide, it's not necessarily that that guide is an expert 
at technically fishing. It's really the guide says, well, we're going down this river and, and the river turns a little bit here to the left. And you know, if, when the river turns to the left, there's a tree and behind the tree, that's where the big fish like to, like to hang out and that's where you can go catch them. And that's the type of advice that I really enjoy giving my clients. Uh, because I have been down this path many, many times, and I have seen uh, companies and what makes them successful or not, and so I have some idea about some of those things. Uh, one example maybe I could give you is um, what happens when founders are fighting with one another? I mean, this is something that I've seen many, many times, and, and uh, my own advice in this situation is if the founders are fighting, one of them has to go. And the reason I say that is, you know, doing a startup company is, by its very nature, sort of a crazy idea, right? I, I, I think it's like getting in a rowboat and saying, well, we're going to row from here to uh, Africa. I mean, it seems very unlikely that you're going to make it. Uh, and, uh, but if you make it, there's going to be a lot of glory. Uh, the problem is, if one person is rowing this way and the other person is rowing that way, well, you're certainly not going to make it. And so this is why I, I've given this advice. Where do I learn all these things? Well, I've learned them really in the boardroom. And uh, what, as part of a startup company lawyer job, I go to the board meetings for all of my clients. Uh, and for me, it's been an amazing experience. And it's why I call this talk my startup MBA, because I feel like I've gotten a, a master's degree in uh, startup companies. I've got the chance to work with some of the, the best entrepreneurs in the world and then to see also the best outside directors, uh, people like Joel Peterson or, or Mark Leslie, who are in fact professors uh, at the Stanford Business School, but they're veterans of, of Silicon Valley who give these guys coaching, and I can hear how do the companies think about their businesses. And it, it's been an amazing journey for me, and I've learned so much, and this is what I want to try to share with you today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a couple of people whom I've worked with, I'm going to talk about what did I learn from them, one special thing that I learned from them, and then I'm going to tell a little story that illustrates that point, and then maybe I'll tell another little story that might be a little bit more fun, and uh, we'll see if we uh, can learn some things. So I'm going to start with Mark Zuckerberg uh, because he's truly an amazing person, and one thing I'll, I'll tell you is um, certainly to have a company like Facebook, you have to be lucky, and Mark has certainly been a ver had a very fortunate uh, existence, but he is one of, the, one of the most, if not the single most intelligent person I've ever met. I mean, he is a really remarkable human being. And what is the one thing that I learned from Mark that I would uh, advise you to think about today? And that is Mark's ability to focus. Focus on what is exactly important and ignore everything else. And it's very difficult because you're running a company and there's this problem and that problem and the other thing. And you can, there's so many different things you could do, you could spend your time on. And without a singular focus on a handful of critical issues, uh, it's going to be very hard to succeed. Let me give a, a story that illustrates this point. In 2009, uh, the growth in Facebook had slowed down. So it had been steadily growing, 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 and it began to plateau a little bit. And we had a board meeting at that time, and the board was going crazy. Uh, Peter Thiel, who was on the board, was saying, oh, this data is terrible. I don't think you understand what a big problem it is. Uh, Jim Breyer, who was also on the board, was saying, wow, I'm, I'm very concerned. The growth is slowing. If these cohorts continue to decay, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, Sheryl Sandberg was saying, well, we're not worried because of these things and that things. There was Chamath Pathapilia, who was the director of growth, trying to explain the, all the issues away. And Mark was just sitting at the front of the table. It looked as if uh, he was watching TV. I mean, he was utterly uninvolved in this conversation, and just letting them go back and forth and yell and scream for a little bit. And about five minutes into it, he said, hey, hey, guys, 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 listen. Um, what you're really talking about are daily active users and the rate of growth of that. That's not actually important. The most important thing is in a social network is the number of items shared on the network. And as long as that's moving, everything else is a trailing indicator. And I had the good, I was actually sitting next to Mark Andreessen when this happened, and Mark gave me that look of like, wow, I mean, this guy really is focused on one thing. And effectively what he said was, listen, none of you guys know what you're talking about, so quit all this bickering and let me go back to running this great company. And, uh, 
And, and I think that is Mark's true gift in the world. He, he is able to kind of listen to all of the different data or look at, observe all of this data and tease out that one thing that is so very important and just steer the ship by that light. Uh, now it takes conviction to make that decision, but uh, it's something that's very important. Uh, my little story about Mark is, uh, I was actually at his house on his 25th birthday, and we were buying a company, and I needed to go get some things signed by him. And we were, I think we were paying $800 million for this company, and Mark's signing the papers, and, and I said to him, you know, happy birthday. And he said, uh, well, I'm 25 years old. I, I'm old enough to rent a car now. So it was a big, big milestone for Mark. The next person I want to talk about is Andy Dunn. He is the uh, founder of a company called Bonobos. And what I learned from Andy is about having passion for the business. Now, this is, I think this is just as critical of a, of a trait because if you don't believe in and love and have passion for your business, how can anyone else get excited about it? Passion is the thing that enables you to recruit great people, which is critical to building a team. Passion is the thing that enables you to raise money because people can feel how you believe in the business. You know, passion is the thing that uh, enables you to work through, work through the hard times because there will be hard times. And so um, uh, and this is the most critical thing I, I learned from Andy. Uh, my story about Andy is that when, uh, when he first called me, uh, Bonobos, oh, I'm, I'm wearing two Bonobos things today, I'm very happy. Uh, he, he, he called me and he said, oh, I'd like you to represent my company, but I don't have any money. Uh, could I pay you in pants? Uh, and I said, no, 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 no payment in pants. The, uh, the next person I want to talk about is my client, Zach Renat. He's the uh, CEO and founder of Model N. Uh, and what I learned from Zach is about perseverance. Uh, Model N was a company that we formed in 1999, and we took public in 2013. 2012, excuse me. 13 years. 13 years to form the company and take it public. And it was uh, an incredible, incredible struggle. It survived the dot-com boom and bust. It survived the 2008 credit meltdown. And Zach was just, he had that tenacity, that perseverance, which I think is critical to having a company's success. My story about Zach is his true inspiration is Shackelford, the uh, e explorer who uh, was stranded in Antarctica. Uh, Shackelford, if you have not heard his story, is amazing. He, uh, his boat got encased by the ice when he was in Antarctica, and they didn't have enough food to survive. So he and four other guys literally got in a rowboat and rowed their way as tiny <laughs> out of Antarctica uh, and, uh, and managed to go find help and bring it back, and, and everyone lived. So that's, uh, that's perseverance for you. Um, the downside, of course, is, uh, of that type of perseverance is you need to have no grasp of reality. And, uh, and that, that's my funny story about Zach. I was negotiating the first contract for this company. The, this is an enterprise software company. And our first customer was Johnson & Johnson, which is, I think, a Fortune 50 company, one of the biggest companies in the world. And uh, there was an issue as to what state's governing law would apply. Now, this is not a very important issue, but Zach was hell-bent on it being our state, California, and not Johnson & Johnson's uh, uh, state, uh, New Jersey. And, uh, and uh, eventually he, he, he saw the light and, uh, and came through on this point. But uh, I think it's a good example to, to, to be, have a successful startup company. You need, to think that you're, uh, you need to think that you're on equal footing with even the biggest companies in the world. Uh, Dropbox, and that's uh, Drew and Arash, the founders of Dropbox. And uh, what I've learned from them is if you're going to do this, you have to do something that you really love. Uh, these guys are... Uh, They've built this wonderful and successful company, but at their hearts, they're hardcore hackers and they love computer programming. And uh, the best story is when I first met them, uh, they, showed, they demonstrated the software. I'd, I'd never seen it before. And the way they did the demonstration is they had a, a Windows machine and a Mac machine, and they just grabbed a file, put it in a folder, and then you would see it on the other machine pop up, right? And, and at that time, I'd never seen that type of live syncing technology. And uh, I immediately realized that uh, this had to be integrated with the operating system. So I asked them, I said, which one of you two hacks into the operating systems? And Drew said, it's me. I said, how old were you when you first did it? 10, 10 years old. So he's obviously pursuing something that he's passionate about. And I think that makes all the difference. Uh, my funny story about Dropbox is when, um, when, they, when they got a new office, they actually got an office 
uh, in San Francisco, right near the Warfield Theater. And the Warfield Theater is a, a classic music venue uh, where bands like you know, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and, and uh, uh, I guess I'm really dating myself with these references. But in any event, many, many famous bands had played. And so I asked Arash, I said, Arash, how do you like the new office? He says, it's great. And I said, Arash, it's right near the Warfield. Have you been to the Warfield? He said, no. I don't really like music. I'm not really into music. I said, well, what are you into? And he said, computers. So I, I think that's a, it's a great lesson uh, that if you do what you love, you're much more likely to be successful. Uh, this is uh, a Nasty Gal, which is uh, uh, my client, Sofia Amoroso, the founder of this company. And what I learned from Sofia is it takes all types. And you really can't tell who's going to be a successful entrepreneur. And when you look at someone like Drew or... or or Mark Zuckerberg there, Harvard, or MIT, and all these fancy schools. Well, Sophia, uh, I think she graduated from high school. She was a community college dropout. She you know, had none of the sort of external markings that you would say, this is going to be a great entrepreneur. And she actually started this amazing company, Nasty Gal, by, uh, by selling on eBay. She had an eBay store called Nasty Gal, and it got very successful. And she said, well, why am I paying eBay 30%? I can start my own thing. And, and now she's built this multi hundred million dollar company. And, uh, and so, you know, really, I think there is no kind of one way to have a, uh, um, one type of person that becomes a successful entrepreneur. It really takes a, a variety of different types. And uh, my funny story about Nasty Gal is, uh, I'm unable to view the site uh, in my office because my, my, uh, my IT department thinks it's pornography. So I'm not allowed to look at any of the, the clothes, apparently. Um, this company is Flickster, uh, and that is uh, Joe uh, Saran and uh, Steve Polsky, the founders. And Flickster, what I learned from them is constant evolution. Uh, and um, what I mean by that is when Flickster started, it was a social site for discussing movies, okay? Well, it turns out that no one really wanted to go to a social site to discuss movies. So then they changed it to a Facebook app to discuss movies and, and to find out about movies. And at that time, Facebook had an open platform, and you were able to acquire users and make a business. And then Facebook deci decided, mm, we really don't like this, and they basically shut down that channel. So very, very quickly, they had to go do something else. And so they found, uh, they actually bought Rotten Tomatoes, you can see Joe wearing his Rotten Tomatoes t-shirt, and came up with the, the movies app for iPhone. And to me, it was like one of those action movies. You know, if you see an action movie and the hero is always running and there's just an explosion right behind him and it looks like he's just about to get exploded. And that's, that's the story of that company. And um, constantly changing, constantly ready to abandon everything that you've done. And they had had successes in each of these areas. They'd be successful and they'd have to completely abandon that business and try something else. And then they were successful, completely abandon the business, try something else. And eventually they were able to uh, sell the company to Warner Brothers. They made a bunch of money and it was, uh, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing story. Uh, my funny story about Flickster is uh, we were selling the company and um, I was actually working on it and I had taken my, my daughter who was then three years old out to breakfast. And uh, all of a sudden this call came and I had to talk to this guy. And uh, so I, I had my daughter, I gave her a, a donut and she was sitting there happily eating and I'm talking to this guy. And this very well-known tech journalist came walking into the restaurant. And I'm on the phone doing this deal and I thought, oh my God, he's gonna hear what I said. So I dove underneath the table and I was underneath the table trying to hide from him. And my daughter was saying, Daddy, Daddy, what are you doing down there? And, and, uh, but he didn't see me, so uh, yeah, that all worked out okay. Uh, Evan Williams, uh, uh, the founder of Blogger, Twitter, and Medium, which is, uh, I mean, I think speaks for itself. What I learned from Ev is um, he, Ev never built a business that was based on how the world is today. He built all his businesses about how he saw that the world would be tomorrow. And Twitter is a great example. Uh, you know, it, Twitter was a mobile-first product, uh, and truly, it was based on uh, on, on portable smartphones. And but he, when when he built it, that just wasn't as they weren't as prevalent, obviously, as they are today. Uh, the same was true for Blogger. I mean, when people when he started Blogger, people thought, "Who's going to write things up on the internet? You know, tell their own stories." But it turns out the answer is a lot of people. Uh, and so I learned from him how to. Uh, how to try to figure out 
don't build the business for how you see the world today, but, but how you see the world evolving. Uh, my, my, fu my funny story about Ev is he's an incredibly humble person. And uh, when he was starting Medium, I mean, look, he, he, he created Blogger, the first blogging company, then Twitter, microblogging, and Medium is this new publishing platform. And when I went to go see him about what he was doing, he said, well, uh, it's about blogging, uh, which I know a little bit about, uh, which I thought was quite an understatement. My Fitness Pal, this is a company we just sold to Under Armour, which is uh, kind of interesting seeing the technology and, and, uh, and consumer product uh, goods world merging. Those are uh, Mike and Andrew Lee, the, the brothers who, who were the founders. And the thing, the single thing I learned from them is, is, is their humility. These are the nicest, most humble guys you would ever want to meet. And they, they come to every meeting, to every situation, about how can I learn from you what you have to offer me? And I find sometimes people say, look, 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 I know all these things, and you know, just tell me this one little thing. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna hear you know, all your ideas. And these guys just turn that right on their heads, and they're so disarming and so intellectually honest. And um, w w the expression that we have is, you wanna be a learn-it-all, not a know-it-all. And I think no, no one I've ever worked with uh, 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 lives that uh, example as well as these two guys. Uh, and they've just had an amazing outcome and it honestly couldn't happen, happen to any nicer people. Uh, Josh Reeves at Zen Payroll. Uh, this is a, one of the, my new younger companies that's just doing fantastic. And, and what I learned from Josh is about instrumentation of the business. And, and what do I mean by that? Everything he does is planned and measured. So this is what sales should look like. This is what the marketing spend should be. This is, what, this is how hiring is going to work. And it's, he goes into exacting detail on each and every one of those things. Uh, I know when we worked together on, on a financing, he said, this is, here's our project plan. This is when it's going to start. This is what days you're going to do these things. I'd never had anyone manage it in such a way. But truthfully, that, that level of detail and, and understanding what are the levers that impact the business have been critical to his success. Uh, my funny story for Josh is he actually lives his entire life this way. I, I met him, I, I ran into him at a, at a party with my wife and uh, he was, uh, in, he is now engaged but he was with his, uh, his then soon to be fiance and he grilled us for about 15 minutes about how does our marriage work, who does what in the family, and you could just tell he sort of wants to instrument his entire life. It was a, it was a very bizarre, bizarre conversation. So the last person I want to talk about is, is Jack Dorsey. Uh, I have him here as the founder of Square. As you all know, he's also the, one of the founders of Twitter, and I've had the great pleasure of working for him in both of those companies. And when his picture comes up on the screen, you probably think I'm going to talk about his design, simplicity, those types of things. And those are amazing attributes, and they're things that are very impressive. But Jack has one trait that I think is critically important for all entrepreneurs, and that trait is an ability to, be, uh, to examine himself and be consistently improving who he is. Uh, when Jack was the CEO of Twitter, he was really a terrible CEO. I would say he was in the bottom 25% of the CEOs I worked with. He didn't have great attention to detail. He was not good at execution. He didn't really understand the job. And look, he made so much money with Twitter, he could have easily just you know, been a celebrity and you know, posted things on the internet and written big think pieces for the rest of his life. But that's not what he did. He decided he wanted to start a company and he knew that to do that he had to improve. And he had to improve as a leader. And he spent a bunch of time talking to people, reading books about management, uh, getting feedback from people, how could he improve. And now I would say as CEO of Square, he's one of the best CEOs I work with. He's a great leader, he's a great manager, and uh, has really been uh, a, an amazing person. Uh, uh, it's really been an amazing transformation. And to me, this is the single most important thing, and this is what I want to end uh, this talk on which is, this is the, uh, the Deming wheel. Uh, it, is, uh, it comes out of something called total quality management, uh, which is a, a, a technique from manufacturing. And it really says that, look, you plan things, you do them, you study them to figure out how you can do better, you act, and then you begin again. And if there's anything I can tell you that, that you will need to be successful as entrepreneurs, it's to follow this pattern. The world is going to change, your business is going to unfold in ways that you weren't expecting, and to do that, you're going to have to uh, 
to continue to change. And so uh, that's the point I want to leave you on today. Uh, I wish you all the best, and thank you for having me here. Hola, hola. Thank you. Awesome presentation. Um, I, I want to make you a, a few questions. Uh, the first one is, um, what makes Silicon Valley what 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 is uh, it's so successful, especially in the the related to the ecosystem? Yeah, I think it's I think it's the culture. Um, we have a culture of collaboration in Silicon Valley, and so. When we meet people, in general, we think, how can I help this person? And that's really a mentality uh, that I think the, most of the great folks in, in Silicon Valley have. And it's not about, well, what can I get out of this situation? Or how will this work to my advantage? It's the thought that if I contribute into the ecosystem and I try to help people, eventually it'll pay forward to me. Uh, and that is uh, one thing I think that uh, all of the other areas that have tried to copy Uh, Silicon Valley, I think, have had a hard time replicating. Um, you was here for the last three months, living in Buenos Aires, and talking with the, the whole ecosystem. What is your your take on that, and, and what we need to do to improve our culture? Yeah. Well, uh, one thing I will say is I think you have incredibly talented people here. Uh, the caliber of the people has been very impressive to me. I think um, there, the two things I would suggest are, uh, first is have to get into that mentality of sharing and collaboration because without it, uh, I, think, I think it's going to be very, di it's very difficult to kind of have one, one company emerge you know, fr from this area. You're going to have to figure out how to work as a group and, and, uh, and collaborate. And the second thing is, of course, you know, the, the, structure, the, the structures aren't in place. You know, we have in Silicon Valley a bunch of different known steps to go through this process. And so think about what those steps are and try to be part of those steps uh, as, as your own company grows uh, because uh, that's, that's going to be critical. When you... We see that in the local ecosystem, we, we can raise a Series C, a Series A in the local ecosystem, but we, when you need serious money, you have to go to Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, yeah. uh, London to raise this kind of money. Uh, what are the, the steps that one company has to do to, in order to achieve this goal? Yeah, I think you're going to have to convince the... Uh, you're going to have to convince investors that there is a big, big outcome uh, involved. And it, they, the, these investors care less about how uh, risky it is. In fact, a, a common mistake I see in, in, in my practice is people come in and say, Well, look, I've got this idea, and it's not really that risky because you can see here that even if this happens or that happens, we could still have a pretty good business. That's not important to this type of investor. The, the type, this, this, this asset class, this type of investor, they don't want a medium outcome, a, a, you know, a one and a half times outcome, a two times outcome. That's the same to them as zero. And they really need, they really need and get paid to find 10, 15, 20x returns. So if you don't have a plan that tells them how you're going to be a 10, 15, 20x return, it's not going to be interesting for them. That means that a few companies from this ecosystem can have this chance. Uh, what is your recommendation to those companies that they have this uh, crazy plan to change the world, to, to get in contact with Silicon Valley? What are the first steps? Yeah, uh, I think... Um, you will be surprised how easy it is to get a meeting. You can get a first meeting with pretty much anyone in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's hard to get a second meeting, and that's the, that's the difficult thing. So when you get those meetings, make sure you're ready. Make sure you do the work to prepare to tell a really compelling story, and a story about how you're going to change the world. And the crazier, the better, to be really honest. Uh, It, I think the harder, the harder companies are going to be companies that are, well, we're like this, but for that. That story is not as compelling. You know, uh, you know I'm on the board of Satellogic, and it's a company that are, they're launching satellites into outer space. I mean, it's the craziest thing you've ever heard. And, uh, but that's the type of company that can get funding uh, from that, this quality of investor. 
Uh, that was, uh, it will be one of the, my questions. Why do you, do you choose uh, Satellogic to be part of the board? Well, I, I would say two things. Really, for, number one is for this reason, because I saw this as a company that could really crazy be... Crazy enough? It was crazy enough, yes. It, it, it passed my bar of craziness. Uh, and the other thing, and, and I think this is also an important lesson for fundraising, is I met the, the founder, and he's amazing. And you have to realize that when you're pitching someone, yes, you're, you're selling them on your idea, but you're really selling them on yourself. And you have to convince them that not only is, do you have a brilliant idea, but you've been thinking about this idea for a long time, you understand it better than anyone else in the world, and you are going to make it happen or die trying. One of those two things. Uh, there's actually, I would recommend, there's a good article about Andreessen in, in, um, in The New Yorker, uh, if, if you can find it online. Um, and it talks about this exact issue, how they think about this issue. The ones that uh, described the whole career the last week? Yeah, last yeah. week. Yeah. Because he, 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 what they want to understand is th they don't actually want to be in a meeting and say, I have a suggestion, and have you say, oh, that's a good idea. They want you to say, oh, I've thought about that, and it doesn't work for these 16 reasons, because I've been obsessing about this problem so much that there's no way you're going to think about something that I don't know. Last question, and the ones that everyone is asking here is, why are you choosing Argentina to, be, to spend one year here, and what, are, what will be your goals to be here? Yes, well, um, I, 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 wanted to go, uh, I wanted to go to a place that was really far away. No, I, the, that's, no look, um, I love the, I love the when, I, uh, when I came to visit, I, I fell in love with the country. I think this is an unusual place because uh, you have such an incredibly well-educated population, such a vibrant culture, uh, and, and such an interesting, uh, an, an interesting uh, uh, way of life uh, that I wanted to learn more about it and, and explore uh, all the great things the country, the country has. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time and, and to be here.